no, vedo uno. Vedete, che ci sono dei altri tu? Come? Let's go see mamma, ok? Come on, let's go see mamma. I've been wanting to strip and repaint the windows for a while now. And I knew also the danger of lead paint. But I didn't stop and think how dangerous can be for Beto. My wife heard a story on the news that old paint can have lead in it. And lead can cause health problems for little kids. So now we're playing it safe and keeping Beto far away from my projects. While most common sources of lead exposure can include old pipes and even soil, the most prevalent source is lead-based paint. The paints that we use today around the house, for example, uh, do not have the high levels of lead that they used to many years ago. So it's the old paint that we're really concerned about, paint on windowsills and on woodwork and so on. Uh, and in this case, on the, those chips, which are old paint. Children are more susceptible to that type of thing because they eat lead paint or they eat paint chips um, and they're also more susceptible because of the amount that they absorb relative to adults. They don't, adults don't absorb as much because of the pH of their stomachs. Uh, scientists have found that uh, kids who eat those chips uh, uh, have impaired uh, intelligence, lower IQs, and because of that, therefore, we're very concerned about uh, kids getting exposed to lead. Everything, including our bodies, is made up of chemicals. Chemicals are the building blocks of the world around us. We eat and drink chemicals to live. They're used to make clothes, computers, automobile parts, fuels, furniture, drugs, cosmetics, and to prepare and preserve foods. Chemicals are used in house cleaning supplies, gardening materials, and in keeping swimming pools and spas clean. Hazardous chemicals may be found almost anywhere. Paint cans, gasoline, old batteries around the house, household and industrial wastes at dump sites, or in polluted water and air. It's truly impossible to avoid chemicals, but it's vitally important to understand how they can affect each of us. It's hard to evaluate the effect of uh, chemicals um, uh, because different people have different sensitivities. Some people are more sensitive. Um, and it's difficult to predict for a whole population because there's variability within the population. People do not categorize all of the things that the toxicologists would categorize as a chemical. Many people just think of these are food, well, it's not a chemical, or lotion, that's not really chemicals. Those are good because otherwise they wouldn't be out there. So I think the awareness of what a chemical is is perhaps one place to start. People need to be aware of the chemicals they come into contact with each day and be equipped with an effective way to evaluate any potential risks and answer the question, is it safe? There are some chemicals for which people are exquisitely sensitive to, and there are some chemicals which are pretty toxic, and everybody, uh, it will show effects. Whether or not you're gonna get adverse effects from a chemical depends on the properties of that chemical, what kind of effects it can produce, and it, it depends on the potency, how potent it is, it depends on how long you are exposed to that chemical, and it depends on your sensitivity to that particular uh, chemical, and it depends on how much enters the body. This basic concept of toxicology, known as the dose makes the poison, was developed nearly 400 years ago by a well-known physician known as Paracelsus. He recognized that low doses would sometimes do beneficial things, and as you push the dose up, eventually you got to the point where the dose, in fact, was producing bad, uh, bad things. So he made that statement, the dose made the poison, and toxicologists adopted that as our motto. If you take a fraction of a dose of aspirin, for example, it isn't going to really do a lot to your system. Uh, if you have a headache and take several aspirins, uh, it will probably alleviate your headache. If you increase the number of aspirin you take, say you take 100 aspirin, for example, then you're in the range where it is likely to produce uh, injury. So as you increase the dose, you increase the likelihood that that chemical is going to produce a harmful effect in your system. So what you need to know is what kind of harm it's going to produce and what dose is required to produce that harm. An example of a potentially harmful dosage can be found in something we're all familiar with, vitamin A. 
Vitamin A or retinol commonly occurs in, in uh, vegetables, it occurs in fruits, it occurs in fish. It can be formed from beta carotene, and beta carotene is an orange material. It's what gives the orange color to squash and to carrots. Retinol, uh, as vitamin A, of course, is essential. We need that in order uh, for our function. But high doses of retinol cause uh, central nervous system damage, and particularly in children. Sometimes, chemical toxicity depends on differences in people. People come in different sizes, ages, weight, genetic makeup, and general health. What may be toxic for a small child, for example, may not be harmful to a large, healthy adult. Size is one factor that makes a child's response to a chemical different from that of an adult. What we're going to do is add a couple drops of uh, dye uh, to the small beaker representing the child and then the same amount of material to the large beaker representing the adult to see if we can see a difference. So I'll add two drops of this dye to the small beaker and two drops to the large beaker. Okay, same amount of material in both beakers. You can see there's a fair amount of color there. But you can see that the color in the beaker representing the child is stronger than the color in the adult. That's one reason why children are more sensitive than adults. Dose is actually what gets into your body or that gets applied at the interface of the skin if you're talking about skin toxicity. Or let's say it causes uh, lung damage. Uh, if you inhale it, then you're going to get a fair dose just by inhaling it. But if the chemical is one that affects the reproductive system or the heart or something else, it has to travel to those organs in order to cause the problem. Another example of a toxic substance can be found in the air we breathe. Well, the first time I had an asthma attack, I had no idea what caused it. It wasn't until later I figured out it was the air itself, the ozone in the air, that was giving me trouble. The ozone in the, the atmosphere prevents uh, the, sun, the ultraviolet rays of the sun from getting to us, and that, of course, causes cancer, melanoma. Uh, so we like that effect. Uh, however, ozone uh, if you inhale it at a high enough concentration, it will damage the lungs. In that case, when it's down in our atmosphere, we call it an oxidant, and it oxidizes lots of things. It will oxidize your windshield wipers, it will oxidize uh, you know, things that you put outside, your lawn furniture, plastic lawn furniture, and it will also oxidize your lungs if you inhale too much of it. So uh, when ozone levels are high, people who have um, already have some particularly compromised lung function are particularly susceptible to ozone levels. People with asthma, for example, may be more sensitive to ozone, and so they can go out early in the morning, for example, because the ozone level doesn't get up until later in the day. The fact that some substances are much more toxic than others means that their dosage has to be closely controlled, which is another way of limiting exposure. A good example is a blood thinner that many older adults take to guard against blood clots that may cause strokes or heart attacks. Known by its brand names as Coumadin or Panwarfarin, the basic chemical in this anticoagulant is called warfarin. Warfarin is another very interesting chemical that you know, initially was found in an agricultural setting. Livestock were eating clover, and sometimes the clover was spoiled. And in, uh, when these livestock would eat the spoiled clover, they would hemorrhage. And for a long time, of course, people thought that was something they wanted to avoid. The people at the University of Wisconsin recognized that that would be a therapeutically desirable material if, we could, if they could identify it, which they did. And they synthesized it, and they named it warfarin. Warfarin was originally marketed as a rat poison it caused rodents to die from internal bleeding. When the dosage was reduced to much smaller amounts, doctors discovered that warfarin worked very well as an anticoagulant, thinning the blood just enough to prevent clotting. Since blood clots can be very dangerous to older adults who are susceptible to strokes and heart attacks. As I've gotten older, I'm developing poor blood circulation. Since the doctor started me on warfarin, I know my chances of developing a blood clot have gone way down, and I don't have to worry so much about heart problems. 
The dose makes the poison is important to toxicologists because uh, we uh, need to figure out what doses do cause harm. So what you need to know is what kind of harm it's going to produce and what dose is required to produce that harm. And that's why we use the system RITE, R-I-T-E. RITE stands for the risk is equal to the toxicity times the exposure. And we're defining the toxicity as what that ke chemical is capable of doing uh, and its potency for doing that. And we're defining the exposure as the concentration of that material and the length of time you're exposed to it. And those two things together determine how much of that material gets into your body, reaches the receptor, and produces the adverse effect. I use right to figure out my risk of exposure to ozone on any given day. Ozone makes me sick, but only if there's a lot of it. I look up ozone levels in the paper. If they're in the green rather than red or purple, I know I won't be at risk because my exposure to ozone will be low. When the ozone levels are up a bit, I walk in the park where there's no traffic and my exposure to ozone won't be as high. That's an example of uh, Wright. She uh, avoids exposure to ozone by figuring out uh, to do her jogging in the morning or in the park, at which time the levels of uh, ozone would be lower. When the doctor prescribed my blood thinner, the first thing I did was do my research. Research can include talking to your doctor or your pharmacist, or even searching online. I found out that at high doses, warfarin can be very dangerous. So it's very risky if you're not careful about how much you take. The use of warfarin to prevent clotting in a, in a patient that needs anticoagulation versus a rat poison, that's an example of uh, right. I think the right model could work for just about anything. Chemicals, uh, radiation, bacteria, biological organisms, you name it. If you know whether that chemical can hurt you, <clears throat> what kind of damage it can produce, and if you know uh, what kind of exposure is required to produce that effect, then you can evaluate uh, that chemical and decide about the risk. I can't really change the toxicity of this chemical, but I could certainly change my risk by doing things like opening up the windows. And he needs to recognize that solvents also can harm the body. So he should follow the directions on the product and he should do this in a ventilated area. And scientists develop these thresholds through thorough and systematic research into a chemical's toxicity. Scientists have many ways of deciding whether something would be toxic. We start very often by looking at a model system. Uh, could be using test tubes, could be using microorganisms, could be using um, possibly animals even. And we would administer amounts of this chemical to one of these uh, microorganisms or possibly a piece of DNA and see if it reacts. If it does react and it looks like it might have a negative effect, we sometimes have to test it more. What we're looking at is how you evaluate the effect of the interaction of a chemical with a biological system, which in most cases is us. The government and scientists and regulators and risk assessors try to help by putting labels on products. They put package inserts in some products. There are signs in some places, in certain states especially, you get a lot of uh, a lot of feedback on what might be harmful in your environment, but nevertheless, it really does still take some uh, personal responsibility to understand what might be a risk to you. You can go to our website, the TEF website, and it will direct you to good sources. One such place, of course, is the National Library of Medicine. The National Library of Medicine has an excellent website. It gives lots of places where one can go to get good information about food and drugs and all kinds of chemical products and other sources of toxins. We recommend, you know, that you go to the best science first and see whether that information, in fact, answers your questions. And reliable, scientifically based information is what you need to make right work for you. Right stands for the risk is equal to the toxicity times the exposure. The right model works for any kind of exposure whatsoever. Many people that use solvents or do welding with metals in the air or pesticides can lower their risk just by changing their exposure. 
You need good information. You need to know about the tox. You need to know about exposure. And if you have that information, then I think people, they can avoid being concerned about a lot of things which uh, aren't really worth being concerned about. Toxicity, risk, and exposure. Three issues we all need to understand and learn to manage in our lives. If you'd like to learn more about the safety of chemicals and toxins in your environment, simply go to www.toxedfoundation.org. You'll find timely information as well as links to other organizations such as the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences.